It once stood as the second tallest building in New York City, and it was home to one of the first newspapers to have reporters out on the field to cover the American Civil War. I'm Tai Chi, and today, Two Minute Architecture Time Machine takes a trip back to Old Newspaper Row in Lower Manhattan to take a look at the Lost Tribune Building. The Tribune newspaper was founded by Horace Greeley in 1841 with the goal of providing a straightforward and trustworthy media source. Greeley had previously published a weekly newspaper called The New Yorker in 1833 and was also the publisher of the Whig Party's campaign newsletter called The Log Cabin. In 1841, he merged the operations of these two publications into a newspaper he named The New York Tribune, also known for a few years as The New York Daily Tribune. The paper achieved a circulation of approximately 200,000 in the 1850s, making it the largest daily newspaper in New York City. The Tribune's editorials were widely shared and copied in other newspapers, which played a part in shaping the national opinion. It continued as an independent daily newspaper until 1924, when it merged with the New York Herald. The resulting New York Herald Tribune remained a publication until 1966. Starting in the 19th century, a section of Park Row directly across from City Hall in Lower Manhattan became known as Newspaper Row. That small block became home to the largest newspapers in the city and showcased some of New York's earliest skyscrapers. In addition to the New York Tribune, Newspaper Row residents included the New York World, the New York Sun, and the New York Times. The New York Tribune's humble beginning started at the north end of Newspaper Row at 160 Nassau Street. The original building was destroyed by fire and was documented by Augustine Castillo in his book titled Our Firemen, A History of the New York Fire Department. Castillo wrote, On February 5, 1845, at 4 o'clock a.m., in the middle of a snowstorm, a boy had lighted a stove, and in half an hour, the building was in a blaze. A new five-story brick building was built on the same location as the original structure, along with an annex on Spruce Street, and opened on May 29th of the same year, just three months after the fire. By the early 1870s, the Tribune had become nationally known, and Greeley was running in the 1872 United States presidential election. The five-story headquarters by then known as the Rookery was functionally outdated and too small for the Tribune's operations. Concurrently, with Greeley's presidential campaign, the Tribune was looking to build a new headquarters. Greeley died in less than a month after his defeat in the 1872 election, but plans for the new building proceeded under the Tribune's chief editor, Whitelaw Reed. Reed purchased the Tribune after Greeley's death and pushed for the construction of a new spacious and fireproof headquarters. There is some evidence to suggest that an architectural design competition may have been held for the building. Documentation exists of a rejected design by J. Cleveland Caddy, which includes a corner bell tower and several layers of round arch arcades. J. Cleveland Caddy's works include the original Metropolitan Opera House at the American Museum of Natural History's South Range. Richard Morris Hunt was ultimately chosen as architect by Reed to design the new Tribune building. Hunt had the distinction of being the first American to be trained at the School of Fine Arts in Paris. He is best known as the designer of the facade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, and the 250-room Biltmore Estate in North Carolina that he designed for Cornelius Vanderbilt. On June 13, 1873, Hunt submitted plans for an eight-story structure to the New York City Department of Buildings. During construction, however, the number of floors would grow from eight to 10. The cost of the building would be $400,000. The cornerstone was laid on January 24, 1874, and almost from the beginning, there were problems. In March of that year, the New York Sun newspaper sued the Tribune in Supreme Court to recover a large amount of damages for encroaching 25 inches on the property line of the Sun. And as reported by the New York Times, a fatal accident occurred in August when a 30-year-old construction worker named John Murray plunged to his death from the fifth floor. The new building opened on April 10, 1875. At 150 feet, it was the tallest building in the city, second in height only to the spire of Trinity Church. Alterations for the building were constructed between July of 1881 and May of 1882. This addition included the construction of a clock tower whose summit was 240 feet above street level. Soon to be known by the public as the Tall Tower, the Tribune building drew criticism from near and far. 
The British architect called it commonplace and unsatisfactory, adding that it was less pleasing in execution than in the illustration. Architectural critic Montgomery Schuler said it was a glaring collection of red and white and black. The New York Times compared it to a sugar refinery, adding that it was a type of architecture which children might appreciate. The entire structure was believed to be absolutely fireproof, but on April 1st, 1888, a blaze broke out in the eighth floor offices of the Homer Lee Banknote Company. It quickly spread to the Tribune's editorial rooms on the ninth floor. Letters, of course, were of no avail to firemen. Firefighters climbed nine flights of stairs with ropes which they lowered to the street. Fire hoses were then attached to the ropes and hoisted up while other firefighters drug heavy hoses up the stairs to battle the blaze. At the same time, Tribune workers on the 10th floor had gotten the stand hoses working, which firefighters then took control of when they arrived. The fire was put out within 30 minutes, but the entire 9th floor was a total loss, including an old oil portrait of Horace Greeley. Although the monetary loss in the New York Tribune was estimated to be less than $2,000, or about $55,000 in today's money, the night editor of the Tribune noted, the loss of paperwork, the library, and original manuscripts can hardly be estimated. In August of 1903, the Tribune Association announced that the building would be expanded from 10 stories to 19 stories. The original master roof would be removed to make way for the new floors. In conjunction with the project, the clock tower would be taken down piece by piece and later rebuilt to top the new building. The Tribune would relocate to the first and second stories of the building, and modifications would be made to the elevators and main entrance. The general contractor for the construction was given to D.C. Weeks & Sons, who started work in May of 1905 and finished in 1907. The new alterations would bring the total height of the building up to 340 feet above street level. The cost was $350,000, or $10.5 million in today's money. In the years following the First World War, the newspaper industry had moved northward, and in 1921, the New York Tribune followed the trend. On December 24th, the New York Times reported that after being located on Nassau Street for 80 years, the Tribune had purchased property on West 40th Street and sold its downtown building. Frank A. Muncy, the owner of The Sun, had arranged to buy the Tribune building. Shortly after that arrangement, Muncy died and the Frank A. Muncy Company completed the purchase with the intent on holding the property as an investment. In 1928, the Muncy Company then sold the building to Museum Estates Incorporated, a company representing the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 1944, the Tribune building was sold to a syndicate, which resold it the following year to Boric Steingart and Boric. It was again sold in July of 1956 to a syndicate headed by Frederick W. Geely, who was the former vice president of Chase National Bank. The New York Times wrote, the new buyer has plans to modernize and air condition the structure. That modernization, however, was not enough to save what had become an unofficial landmark. The city moved to condemn the building in July of 1966, and Pace University took ownership of the site six months later. Pace announced that it would demolish the New York Tribune building as part of the redevelopment program to make way for one Pace Plaza. The Jade Demolition Company was hired to demolish the building. The demolition created so much dust that the Department of Buildings issued the demolition contractor several summonses for pollution. It wasn't long before the Tribune building was reduced to a block of rubble. One Pace Plaza opened in 1970. Although the demolition of the Tribune building largely went unnoticed, the Brooklyn Museum's director at the time called the demolition heartbreaking and that the building had been a sumptuous Victorian conglomerate in glorious Ruskinian color. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and let me know in the comments what your thoughts are about the Tribune building. Also, if there is a lost New York City building you'd like me to cover, leave me a note about that as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.